Hello, my name is Mark Sundahl, and I, it's my honor to welcome you to Infinity and Beyond, Space Law 1.0. This presentation has been hosted by and organized by Laurina, which is a portal uh, that provides resources to lawyers around the world and uh, also builds a community for those lawyers to participate in. Um, space law has been an extraordinary field. And I'm very happy to see that there is plentiful registration for this presentation. And uh, I hope that you find it as fascinating as I do. Space law has, is not a new area, but uh, it has undergone a, an extraordinary transformation in the past few years uh, due to the uh, extraordinary uh, technological innovations that have taken place. Now, let me introduce myself before I go any further. My name is Mark Sundahl, and I'm a professor of law at Cleveland State University, where I am the founder and director as well of the Global Space Law Center, which is the only space law center at a United States law school that is dedicated exclusively to the study of the law of outer space. And I offer, as you will see, uh, a, and I will discuss further, um, a curriculum at the Global Space Law Center uh, for those of you who are interested in pursuing uh, your study of space law beyond this presentation. And uh, so I will be providing information about that as we go along and I'll reference the Global Space Law Center. But let me make the point of saying now that uh, we offer a course and that will be offered again in the fall of next year, 2022, uh, that is open to all whether you are an executive in the space industry, whether you are a law student uh, earning your JD now, whether you are a high school or college student and you wanna get a taste and understanding of this fascinating area of the law that governs the activities of governments and ever increasingly private actors in outer space. My other credentials, and uh, they go back uh, some time. I have a great deal of experience in the field of space law. As I said, it's not a new area of the law, and I've been working in the field for a good 20 years or so. And currently, in addition to directing the Space Law Center, I'm an employee of NASA, where I serve as an advisor to the NASA administrator on uh, new regulations and policies concerning NASA's operations, and uh, much of that work has been focused on the relationship between NASA and private entities uh, that we see emerging in the spacescape. So let's uh, dig into the material here now and talk a little bit about the space industry and what exactly men and women are doing in space and have been doing in space. Of course, it, um, uh, I want to nod my tip my hat again to Laurina and thank them for making this possible and uh, allowing me to kind of broadcast this field of law that is gaining new traction and expanding steadily and is offering new opportunities to those who study it and become knowledgeable in the field of space law. Believe me, there's a need for new space lawyers and good space lawyers. So if you set your sight on a career in space law, you won't be disappointed. But let me turn to uh, what we're doing in space, because I always think as a first principle, and this goes to whatever area of the law you are studying, um, is that before you regulate an area of activity, you wanna understand that area of activity. What exactly is being done and what the goals are and what the policy needs are. And then, only then do you try to figure out and determine what the rules are that should govern the activity in order to serve the interests of the stakeholders and those that are, are active in, the, in that area. So let's look at that. Um, of course, man's activity in space began with Sputnik, and I think we'll all be familiar with this, uh, the beautiful design of the Sputnik satellite, which I always was an admirer of. It's not much as far as its technical specification goes. It was roughly the size of a basketball, and all it did was emit an, an electric signal, a radio signal that's a beep that could be picked up by antennae on Earth. And it circled the Earth. It was put, put into orbit in 1957, and it was the first great success of, of the Russians. Uh, both the United States and Russia were, of course, racing to 
uh, log achievements in outer space. And Sputnik, the Russians uh, won that first round by putting Sputnik into orbit. It's a little known fact, of course, Sputnik gets all of the, uh, the, the recognition, but the United States soon afterwards put its own satellite into orbit, which was known as the Explorer. Uh, and one last thing, I, I, I have to say that what strikes me most about the Sputnik is its beautiful design. If you look at satellites these days, they look like a mishmash of different electronic parts, but the Sputnik was clean and beautiful, and its swept back antennae make it look like it's in motion, even when it's standing still. So I'm an admirer of the artists that were involved in that project. So this is a, a more typical uh, satellite, also beautiful in its own way. I think uh, the artistic uh, beauty of satellites has maybe declined through the years, but this uh, has its own charm. Uh, and this was a telecommunication satellite. And I'm going to be talking, really emphasizing in this early part of the presentation, uh, how space activity in the space industry has evolved. And the original applications, the uses of outer space, we're all familiar with. It's, it's based on satellites like this one. This is a Telstar satellite, a telecommunication satellite to bounce signals off of so that we can communicate uh, very easily from one part of the Earth to the other. So telecommunications is one of the, the traditional uses of outer space. Um, remote sensing uh, in plain language, that is taking photographs of the Earth. We are all familiar with that. If you look at Google Earth today, but for many years, we had cartographers, map makers, using photographs from outer space to make maps or to observe different phenomena on the surface of the Earth, be it uh, weather systems or natural disasters, or looking at uh, now uh, satellites can be used to look at parking lots to determine which businesses are successful, where is there greater traffic. All you have to do is look from outer space and see where the cars are parked. Um, so these are some of the traditional uses of outer space, remote sensing, telecommunications. Another uh, application of outer space that is very commonly known and, and we're all familiar with is GPS, which we use on our, our cell phones in order to determine our location. So navigation is another longstanding use of outer space. But what has changed is that these are no longer the exclusive uses of outer space. And then we have new uses of outer space, space tourism, uh, extraction of natural resources, uh, private space stations. These are the big changes. And these changes in the industry are driving changes in the law. And that's why this field of law is so exciting right now. This is a, a transformational phase that will last uh, this particular phase, I'd say, for the next 10, 20 years to really... Uh, reorient the corpus of space law to its new commercial realities. Um, but that isn't the only trend I'd like to bring to your attention. The other one is the movement of space activity from the province of government agencies to private corporations and private individuals. Uh, that doesn't mean that corporations haven't always been involved. They always have been from the beginning. If we uh, look at, uh, and these are, of course, the antennae that are earthbound that are part of the space-based telecommunications infrastructure. We have these beautiful uh, satellite arrays that communicate with our satellites in orbit. Um, but if you look at the early achievements of the US government in outer space. This is the Saturn V rocket that transported astronauts to the surface of the moon. If you look at, at that rocket, who was it built by? Of course, uh, your uh, first impulse would be to say NASA. And that's right that NASA was the prime contractor, was uh, overseeing the project, but there were other people involved, and those were private entities, such as Boeing, McDonnell Douglas, Lockheed Martin, North American Aviation, whom my mother worked for, believe it or not, setting into, I think, motion, a family tradition that has led to, well, led to this presentation today. 
Uh, so private organizations, private entities, corporations have always been involved in the space activity, but what has changed is that they're no longer working for NASA. Now they're working for themselves. And NASA is merely a customer buying seats, for example, on SpaceX's Dragon capsule to taxi NASA astronauts from the surface of the Earth to the International Space Station. So the nature of space activities has changed, and then the identity of the actors, the space actors, has changed. And the regulation of this private activity by private individuals uh, that is of a new nature, that's where the challenges arise. Of course, this is a famous picture of Buzz Aldrin standing on the surface of the moon after we um, planted a flag. And uh, this will turn up later in a different segment of this presentation. And why don't I, I take a second to uh, lay out a roadmap for where this presentation is going. I'm going to continue to kind of give an overview of the nature of space activity. And then we're going to, to turn our sights to the law. What is space law? Where does it come from? Who makes it? Um, and then what are some of its general principles? And then what I think is the most important one and the, the item that you're probably all here for is what are the challenges? What is the work to be done for the next generation of space lawyers? And I'm talking to you. You are the next generation of space lawyers. The Global Space Law Center is here to educate you and prepare you for a career in space law. Lorena is here to provide you the resources, the access to legislation and the uh, primary sources of space law. But you are the ones that are actually going to determine what the shape of, of space law in the future is going to be. And I will try to uh, direct your mind and give you some focus by telling you what the problems are. And you can start thinking about them today because they are far from being solved. But this is a, a picture of our traditional space activity managed by NASA. Where have we uh, gone from there? Well, we, um, we built a reusable space plane, the shuttle. And that was a huge step forward uh, because it was reusable. We didn't have to throw a rocket away every time we uh, went on a space mission. Imagine driving to the grocery store and throwing away your car, sending it to the junkyard every time and having to buy, spend another $30,000 on a car. Well, that's what has traditionally been done. The space shuttle was a huge step forward towards reusability. However, its design was such that it really didn't um, provide the, uh, the financial benefit that was hoped. It cost a billion dollars to uh, recondition it for a next launch. And there were portions of the space shuttle launch system that weren't reusable, such as the booster rockets that it was tied to. So it was a step in the right direction, but it was not yet the holy grail. Uh, and it is that holy grail of use, reusability that we've only recently discovered through the work of SpaceX and Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and their work, but more on, on that in a moment. Um, I have to say, you might recognize uh, the young man there uh, without a hat is, um, is me. And I was taking a look at the space shuttle with my mom, uh, Gisela Sundahl, and my brother, John Max. So that's uh, another bit of the history of this space lawyer. Um, the International Space Station is perhaps our greatest achievement. It's the most complex and the most expensive thing that has ever been built by man, um, I believe it's the value of it is approaching a trillion dollars, but its lifestyle, its lifespan is also about to expire. If it reaches 2030, I think we'll be fortunate. Um, and that'll be the last great uh, outpost in, in orbital space that is controlled exclusively by the government. What is coming next? Private activity. And uh, this is the beginning of it. This is the landing of two rocket boosters simultaneously after the launch of a Falcon 9 rocket by SpaceX. Uh, this is beautiful ballet. It's rocket. It's art in motion. 
Um, but this is the holy grail, is to be able to reuse rockets. And the importance of that is that it reduces, it reduces the cost of achieving orbit and achie achieving uh, transportation to the moon or beyond by exponentially. Um, it has gone down, it will be cut in half, and then half again, half again, half again, making space accessible for the common man, for the common company, much more accessible than ever before. And what does that mean in turn? That means that business models and activities that were never possible before because they were simply too expensive are now possible. So a lot of ideas are being taken off the shelf, things that were proposed uh, long ago, but were simply unsustainable because it costs too much to, for example, build and keep aloft manufact private manufacturing facilities in orbit to uh, develop uh, stem cell-based pharmaceuticals. Um, very promising, very much needed. The benefits of outer space are undeniable, the zero gravity environment for manufacturing such things, but was just too expensive. But now, that those costs have come down, those business models are now back on track. And new business models are being developed every day. So I ask you to think creatively about that. You may be the lawyer who provides the advice and guidance to these companies that are breaking the, pushing the bounds of what is possible, or you may actually be the executive and the founder of a company. Uh, that develops new uses of outer space. So think large, think big, uh, be aggressive, uh, dream fiercely, because the future will be extraordinary. And uh, now we're getting into some of the new applications in space, some of the new uses of outer space. It's no longer simply telecommunication, remote sensing, navigation and GPS, weather forecasting, all helpful things. But now we're adding to that list. And one of the things that's being added is space tourism. And this is a, a new design of a, a new spacecraft, a reusable spacecraft again. Uh, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and through Blue Origin and SpaceX respectively have developed their reusable rockets. But Virgin Galactic pictured here, their spaceship uh, two, I believe it is, although they developed a beautiful uh, silvery metallic spaceship three already which is larger and faster and better uh will be sending tourists for a quarter million dollars a ticket for now and maybe it's gone up to 400 grand but we'll be sending tourists into outer space and we've already had a few flights we all saw rich sir richard branson uh on the maiden flight for tourists and uh this space plane can go into suborbital space at this point uh, no further, but hey, you have to take one step before you take the next. Um, so space tourism, private space stations. I mentioned that the International Space Station will be retired in the, in the near future, or it will be sold off to private investors who will then rehab it and retrofit it and maybe stretch its lifespan. Uh, but what is uh, also happening is that there are multiple companies this is Blue Origin's uh, uh, space station, but multiple companies are planning to build free-flying private space stations. So imagine, now we can, uh, it used to be that only NASA astronauts, that is test pilots who are rigor rigorously trained for years uh, and earned a spot on a rocket uh, owned by NASA, would fly to the International Space Station, also owned uh, at least partly by NASA and our international partners, uh, to conduct scientific missions. That is the old model. NASA astronauts, NASA space station, scientific missions. Now what we're looking at is an ordinary person, if you have the money, of course, um, can buy a seat on the SpaceX Dragon capsule, fly to the Blue Origin space station, and maybe play zero gravity soccer in one of these large modules that are part of the space station. 
that is engaged in recreational uses of outer space. Or perhaps there will be a yoga retreat in a zero gravity atmosphere of a private space station. Or you could go on spacewalks. Um, those are recreational activities, but of course uh, there will also be commercial activities such as zero gravity manufacturing and other types of private research as well. Scientific research in space won't go away, of course, um, but it will share the spotlight now with private commercial uses and private recreational uses. And that is the extraordinary leap that has suddenly happened. Yes, there was there are many years leading to it, but it has suddenly come to fruition. And now is the time for commercial space. And there has not been enough education in the field of space law. And there is a need for space lawyers because the field of space law is notoriously complex. And therefore it needs properly trained space lawyers. It needs you to study space law, to provide the guidance and ultimately uh, even help draft and enact new legislation that will facilitate the, the continued expansion of the industry. Um, of course, our plans are bigger than free flying space stations in orbit. We are on our way, led by NASA and the Artemis program uh, with uh, international partners that have joined the, the T. We are building a uh, an international space station in orbit around the moon, the Lunar Gateway, that will then serve as the halfway point to uh, for vessels that will land astronauts and equipment on the surface of the moon. And that is merely a testing ground for similar plans to go to Mars. And this is a model of the Martian community that is envisioned by Elon Musk. And there you see his starships three, four starships that are on the, the landing pads there. And I don't have a picture of this for you, but you may have seen it. It's a very large rocket capable of transporting 100 people into orbit to the lunar surface and ultimately, ultimately, ultimately to Mars. And this is intended to be quickly reusable. Uh, SpaceX is building a fleet intends to build a fleet of hundreds of these and to have them constantly launching and ferrying people to the surface of Mars and building a city of a million people. That is the ultimate goal. Many steps between here and there, but that is the future. So now we're coming to the next segment. I hope I've laid the foundation and you see what the the societal transformational changes that we're facing. Uh, and now, hand in hand with these technological developments and the goals of these visionaries, hand in hand must be the law. Lawyers must be involved. Laws must be created. I'm going to talk to you about uh, what space law is, uh, where it comes from, uh, its fundamental principles, and its hardest challenges. And then I'm going to be taking questions. So as I go through this, please formulate your questions. I've received some already. Um, uh, I'm going to be answering your questions. And uh, the best answer, I mean the best question, I hope to give good answers throughout, but the best question uh, will uh, win a prize. And the award will be um, an opportunity to uh, receive a private uh, mentoring session with me. And uh, I look forward to meeting you one-on-one, uh, -on -one, but I hate to say that it's limited to just one person. I encourage you all to, to reach out to me uh, and to uh, take a look at the Global Space Law Center offerings and my course uh, next semester or next year, you are all invited. Um, and I want to mention that if you are watching this on YouTube and you're interested in submitting a question uh, which I think you can do still on YouTube, but if you're interested in uh, uh, submitting a question through the platform that we are presenting this on, or if you'd like to participate in uh, presenting a question that could be selected for the best question, uh, you can still register. So if you go to the Lorena website and you uh, um, 
Uh, if you simply Google Infinity and Beyond, uh, my name, Sundal and Laurina, it will come up. Uh, you can still register while this is going on so that you can access uh, the, the Q&A and vie for the prize. Um, so please go ahead and do that. But let's talk about space law. Where does it come from? Uh, as I said, it's not new. Um, it's been around since the 60s. It's been around for some 60 years. And it emanated first from the United Nations. Uh, this is a, a view of the plenary chamber in the United Nations building in Vienna, which is where the Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space uh, meets. And it meets uh, uh, multiple times throughout the year to debate uh, the most pressing issues of space law and to formulate both hard law, that is treaties, binding treaties, and soft law, which is non-binding, which are non-binding instruments such as guidelines, best practices, um, uh, instruments that that seek good behavior, certain behavior from countries, even if it's not binding legally. Um, but the uh, the optimal form of law is a binding treaty that must be respected by all parties. Um, and this is uh, yours truly actually uh, speaking to the plenary uh, at the United Nations a few years ago, uh, where I spoke and encouraged all the nations of the world to adopt the U.S. model of involving industry when developing legislation. As I said at the very outset, it's important to understand what it is you're regulating. So if Congress wants to pass new laws uh, regulating, for example, the space industry, the space tourism industry, uh, they better first understand it and what is happening technically and what the business issues are and what the effect of the legislation is going to be and what the goals of the legislation should be. And the only way you can understand that is by talking to the people that are actually bending metal and lighting rockets. And uh, the United States does a very good job of that. I've been, uh, I've served on committees in Washington, for example, the Commercial uh, Space Transportation Advisory Committee, which is a group of private people, private citizens, mostly executives from companies, but also academics, who advise directly the FAA about new regulations and laws because the FAA is the agency in the United States that issues launch licenses. You know, you can't just launch a rocket out of your backyard. You have to get a launch license from the FAA. And uh, there are many regulations, of course, around that and a, an involved process. Uh, and that is constantly being modified and improved according to the needs of the industry, because we're launching now not just uh, telecommunication satellites, but we're launching human beings who are not trained astronauts into suborbital and orbital space. And so the requirements for launching that should be different, and they are different. Um, but uh, the U.S. does a very good job of listening to the private industry before doing anything. Uh, this is a famous picture of our President John F. Kennedy, JFK, signing, ratifying uh, on the part of the United States, the Outer Space Treaty, um, uh, which is the Magna Carta, the Constitution of Outer Space. It was developed by the United Nations. It was ratified by the U.S. and most other countries in the world, certainly all of the uh, major space powers. Um, and before I go on to the fundamental principles, I want to stress uh, another theme. You know, I've talked about the emergence of private actors, uh, the development of new uses of outer space. Um, and I want to, on the legal side, stress this theme, that space law is multidimensional. It is complicated. It is challenging. And that's what makes it fun. That's what makes it interesting. And that's what makes it an excellent career choice for a young lawyer. Um, and it's multidimensional in this way. First of all, it's very broad. What is space law? Um, it can be anything from laws of war, governing uh, uh, the military use of outer space, to safety regulations for private suborbital space tourists and everything in between. 
It could deal with the criminal law for crimes uh, committed on the International Space Station, or it could deal with immigration law on the surface of Mars. Um, so the subject matter is extremely diverse and multidimensional in that respect. But space law is also multidimensional in the fact that it exists on the international level, the regional level, for example, the European Space Agency and its governing documents and laws, which governs the region of Europe. Uh, it's domestic, that is by country. The U.S. has, under Title 51 of the United States Code, voluminous laws on the use of outer space and then uh, attendant uh, regulations that implement those laws in the Code of Federal Regulations. So there are a lot of domestic laws on the federal level, and then even state laws. So on the lowest level, for example, there are states in the United States that have tried to attract Virgin Galactic and other suborbital space tourism companies to their states, to their state spaceports, which have been, uh, have been growing in number around the country, trying to attract these companies by passing laws that eliminate those companies' liability in the event of an accident. So if someone is harmed or killed, uh, if something goes awry uh, when Virgin Galactic flies its private space plane into suborbital space, uh, these private laws, these state laws, eliminate liability. Now, we can debate whether that's a good or a bad thing, but that's an example of space law. So multidimensionality is an issue. Um, but what are some of the fundamental uh, principles? Let me uh, talk to you a little bit about that before we get into, I think, the most interesting part of the presentation and where I hope a lot of the uh, questions go so that we can even hear you and I together uh, make some progress in resolving the most challenging issues of space law. But let's get first to some of the basic concepts. What is space law? And I'm drawing these concepts from the Outer Space Treaty. There are uh, five multilateral space treaties that have been drafted in the United Nations, uh, all of them in the 60s and 70s. There hasn't been a major space treaty since 1979. But it's the Outer Space Treaty, as I mentioned, the Magna Carta, which sets out the basic principles of, of space law. And then we have the uh, Convention on... Uh, the rescue and return of astronauts. We have a convention on liability. And we have a treaty on the registration of space objects so that we all know what is where. And then finally, we have the Moon Agreement, which details uh, additional and more specific rules with respect to lunar activity. However, that fifth and final multilateral treaty from the 60s and 70s is largely seen as a failed treaty because it has not been signed by the major space powers. So we have four really critical uh, space treaties that define international space law. And uh, one of the fundamental principles is that space is to be used exclusively for peaceful purposes. And, that, uh, and part of that is a prohibition on the stationing of weapons of mass destruction thinking of nuclear weapons in orbit. It's illegal for any country to station a nuclear weapon in orbit. And this points out one of the opportunities of space law. The opportunity to remake society in a better image, to leave behind on Earth the frailties and the flaws of our history and our baser human tendencies to make a better world. And that is what is attempted in the Outer Space Treaty by prohibiting nuclear weapons in orbit. Now, that doesn't mean that military um, vehicles are not allowed whatsoever in space. The space is still used heavily by the military in an ever-expanding way. Militaries uh, around the world rely on space-based infrastructure, on photographs of of their enemy's military installations from, from satellites, of the telecommunication systems, two satellite guided bombs. So the uh, use of outer space by the military is very much a reality. 
But the, the rule is that there are no nuclear weapons in orbit and that all activities, even military activities, it may sound um, contradictory, but even military activities must be uh, carried out for a peaceful purpose. Space use shall be used exclusively for, for peaceful purposes. And what does that mean? You can still have military active and make use of satellites and be active in, in space, but it can only be used for the peaceful purpose of self-defense and not for aggressive uh, purposes. So peaceful purposes. The Death Star, I, uh, I get this question on a regular basis. Would it be legal for the United States or another uh, country to construct the Death Star? A, a, a artificial planet that has the ability to destroy real planets with its mega laser. Um, well, you would not be able to station that in orbit because that is certainly a weapon of mass destruction. So you wouldn't be able to put it into orbit of the Earth as a second moon, an artificial moon. Um, but you would be able to uh, build it out in deep space as long as it was used exclusively for peaceful purposes, that is, self-defense. Um, here's another, another fundamental principle. That is the freedom of use. Uh, it's one of the things that distinguishes space law from other areas of of law, such as aviation law, is that you can fly freely over the territory of another country. You don't need the consent of another country, unlike air law, where if you put a fly a plane over another country, you need their prior consent. Not true. So everyone is free to go anywhere in outer space, and you don't need the permission of another country to go anywhere. But balancing that is that, yes, you're free to go to the moon. Everyone is. But no country is allowed to appropriate it in any manner. So when we had the, uh, uh, the picture of Buzz Aldrin planting a flag in the moon, he did not claim it as a 51st state. And it would have been illegal under the Outer Space Treaty. Uh, it was simply as a gesture that we have arrived, but we have arrived in peace for all of humanity. Uh, you cannot claim uh, any celestial body. It cannot become a new province of China, for example. Uh, what about liability? The Outer Space Con uh, Treaty, coupled with the Liability Convention, which came a few years after, uh, establishes liability. Strict liability, that means uh, without any defenses for any damage caused on the surface of the Earth or to an airplane in flight from by a space object. So if a satellite re-enters, um, um, uh, the atmosphere, I believe I have a picture here, um, and uh, we have uh, spacecraft re-enter the atmosphere on a regular basis. If a component uh, crashes on the Earth and causes damage, injury, death, damage to property, the launching state is strictly liable. Now, the, the, um, and here we have a graphic of the breakup of the Tiangong, the Chinese space station, which happened not long ago. Uh, mo most of things that re-enter vaporize in the atmosphere, but we do have pieces that survive re-entry. Um, what about if damage is caused in outer space? Here we have a portion of a part of the uh, space shuttle that has been hit by a piece of space debris traveling at 17,000 miles an hour. And it can be minuscule. It could be like the grain, a uh, grain of sand, and it still can can break right through a panel of steel. Um, so damage caused in orbit, in space, uh, will be the fault. Will uh, enable you to uh, impose liability on the launching state, but only if they're at fault. And that is a question of debate. What does it mean to be at fault? when conducting a damaging space activity. Now here we have a few other uh, basic uh, concepts. That is that uh, all, all states are required to authorize and continually supervise private activities. And that is the basis for national regulation and why we have so many domestic regulations is that international law requires it. 
And the United States has a very robust private space industry. We have a lot of space activity being conducted by private individuals and companies. And so we have a lot of regulations and that's required by international law. Uh, it's also required that you register your space objects so that everyone knows it's a public registry uh, uh, operated by the UN and it's publicly searchable. You can go online right now and search what's in orbit. Uh, there's an obligation to rescue and return astronauts. If uh, a space plane goes off course, um, all countries are required to make efforts, reasonable efforts to rescue them and must return them to the launching state. Um, and these are, are two of these last two are among the most important and the most controversial in today's uh, lunar landscape, space legal landscape. And that is that everyone is required to operate with due regard for the interests of others. You need to consider what others are doing in space and operate with deference, with due regard. And hand in hand with that is the requirement that you not cause harmful interference. Everyone is free to use outer space, but we shall not interfere with each other and we shall take into consideration everyone's interests. And what exactly that means is uh, to be debated. Although I don't have it listed here, I should mention one other fundamental principle and in fact, um, it should have been mentioned uh, right at the outset, is that all space activity must be conducted for the benefit of all humankind. The benefit of all countries, regardless of their state of, uh, of political or financial development. And the meaning of that is very, uh, is very much in debate right now. Does that mean that if you harvest a trillion dollars worth of platinum from an asteroid that it must be shared for the benefit of all countries equally? Well, we don't share profits that are made by telecommunications companies, so I think that that will not be the uh, winning interpretation. But those words do mean something. There's no surplusage in international treaties. Every word means something. So what does that mean? Uh, it's often viewed as really that we give opportunities for inclusion and partnership, that we share data and science that is discovered in space. But does it mean something more? What are some of the challenges? Now we get to the meat of the, of the presentation. You've been prepared. Uh, now what, is, what work is still left to be done out there? Um, space debris. We have massive amounts of space debris. Um, much of it is unidentified. Uh, should it be prohibited to create space debris? Eventually it is said that we'll have so much space debris that it will no longer be possible to use outer space, that it will cover the earth like a blanket and that we will cut ourselves off from space. And when something is in orbit, if it's a high enough orbit, it's in orbit for hundreds if not thousands of years. So should we prohibit it? Uh, there are guidelines in place. There are efforts to, to mitigate debris. Um, what about the, who should be at fault? Um, what about anti-satellite tests that, were re, that are conducted, unfortunately, on a fairly regular basis in 2007 by China, 2008 by the United States, 2020 by India, and just a few weeks ago by Russia? And these tests are kinetic. They fire a missile at a satellite. They, they're always at their own satellites. So it's not an act of war. But what it does do is showcase their military strength. And it creates massive clouds of debris that will remain in orbit for 500 years. And they're already threatening the International Space Station, forcing it to engage in evasive maneuvers. It is said that that is legal. But there is a movement afoot to ban kinetic anti-satellite tests, and I think it must succeed if we are to continue to use outer space. So space debris is a, and the military use of outer space is a, is a very challenging topic. Here we have, unfortunately, the wreckage of a Virgin Galactic spaceship on the floor of the Mojave Desert in California. Um, and that gives rise to safety regulations. To what degree should we regulate space tourism companies? Some want to regulate them like an airline. Others have won the day 
because there are virtually no safety regulations for suborbital space flight. The regulatory system is based on informed consent, that you assume the liability if you buy a ticket. Um, is that enough? Um, here we see Buzz Aldrin again, planting a flag on the moon. He did not claim it as the 51st uh, US state, um, but it goes to the question of property rights. And uh, it is the basic understanding that private property is impossible in space because it's based on a country having ownership, having sovereignty over the land, and then granting certain parties ownership, which is based on sovereignty. And if there is no sovereignty, can there be private property? Or can there be something similar to private property? Taking that a next step, what about space mining? This is the artist's depiction of a mining operation on the moon. Can you own parts of a celestial body, even if you can't own an area on the moon? Uh, the consensus on that is yes, uh, although it's, it's still a spirited uh, debate. Um, the United States, Luxembourg, Japan, the UAE have all established laws clarifying that it's legal to own whatever you extract from a celestial body. So we seem to have handled that issue. Now the next one is, can you, can you claim, can you stake a claim for a portion of the moon that has minerals or ice, most, it's the most valuable? Um, that is too close to an ownership right and does not have legal clarity yet. So we are working on that. Um, can you grab an entire asteroid and mine it till it's all gone if it is uh, if you can own what you mine and the entire asteroid is made of platinum, can you mine it until it's no longer in existence? Well, some pro rightly say that if you destroy something, that is an act of ownership, and that should be prohibited under international law, um, but an undecided question still. Mega satellites. Um, we had about 6,000 operational satellites in orbit. Uh, Beginning, uh, beginning of last year. Now we've uh, multiplied that. Um, and we will continue to multiply it by a factor of, of five, 10. Uh, within the next couple of years, we'll go from 6,000 active satellites to 60,000 or 100,000. And the FCC, uh, the agency that, that licenses uh, telecommunications, has allowed that. Um, but it's obviously creating space traffic management issues and debris. So that's another issue. And probably the grander issues uh, will be um, how do we operate entire communities? Uh, will there eventually be an independent state, a new country on Mars, for example? And Elon Musk has suggested that there will be. There will be Martian laws. And uh, that has triggered some space lawyers. So uh, space lawyers are those that understand all these things and that help countries navigate these regulatory shoals and help influence the creation of new legislations. And uh, how do you build a career in space law? Well, you start out by taking a course in space law. You can do that at the Global Space Law Center at Cleveland State University. Uh, there are a few other law schools that, that offer courses, but they are few and far between. And this course that I offer is available to all. So now we've reached the um, uh, question and answer portion. We've got 10 minutes here. Um, so um, I'm going to rely on my moderators here to post some questions that have come from you. I heard there are a lot of them. Uh, so here's one. How can people early in their career make meaningful connections to the space law community? Well, I'd say by joining activities and organizations such as the Moon Village Association, such as the International Institute of Space Law. Um, those are organizations that you can get involved in until you start to meet people. Start making connections through LinkedIn and other uh, tools. Um, but get involved. Uh, go to conferences, and a lot of them are online and free, just like the one here today, and get FaceTime with people that are already involved. It's, a, it's a, still a very, a rather small community of space lawyers, and you can break in 
and make meaningful contributions and rise through the ranks rather quickly. It's, this is the time to act and get involved. Uh, what should today's teenagers know about good citizen, citizenship uh, as space activity involves? I think uh, uh, the most important thing is to be a good steward of the environment, the space environment, uh, so that it can be shared uh, not only with, with our fellow uh, men and women operating in space. I talked about operating with due regard of corresponding interests. We should all think not only of the interests of those that are alive today, but also the interests of our children and our children's children to make sure we don't create uh, this cataclysmic wall of space debris or deface the surface of the moon, which we all, I think, have an intimate human connection with. Uh, we don't want to see scarring on the face of the moon from Earth. More questions? How do you approach balancing ethics and innovation in relation to creating regulation that safeguards yet does not uh, stifle innovation? Yes, that is a great question, and that is the balancing act, especially when dealing with, uh, for example, space tourism. We want to protect the people on the ground, and laws are in effect to do that. We uh, a launch license is only granted if. Uh, it is safe to the people on the ground that uh, FAA is convinced that it won't explode or go off course. Um, but we're not quite doing enough to safeguard the, the health and safety of passengers. Um, and so that is an ethical issue. The industries don't want over regulation, of course. Um, but at the same time, we need to look out for safety. So balancing those uh, those two considerations is critical and uh, it's being done today for space tourism by um, by in its early stages keeping regulation at a minimum level and then slowly increasing it as the industry becomes stabilized and becomes profitable and we have uh, data so that's a good one uh, do you think that, uh, this is from Jerry Yao, do you think that lawyers, legal practitioners should be included in the jobs that space settlement programs look for? Absolutely. Or would it always be a matter of legal disputes in space colonies being outsourced back here for earthbound space lawyers? So will we need, I, I think this question is, will we need uh, lawyers actually on the surface of the moon? Uh, and I think a lot of jobs will continue to be outsourced, but eventually um, I, I think uh, you know, you want uh, lawyers to have a first-hand look. It might be a crime scene, and you need the lawyers and investigators to be there on hand uh, to investigate things that can't be done remotely. Uh, so a good question, and I think in time uh, that will come. But lawyers should be involved from the very beginning, even if not on the surface of, a, of the moon. Um, they should be involved in these projects and the laws need to be considered because we do not want to and cannot operate in chaos. Thank you, Jerry. Krishna. Uh, if space has so many dimensions, especially international and regional, whose jurisdiction is the people or companies that come under and considering we don't have anything to demarcate boundaries? Good point, and this is largely settled in the Outer Space Treaty, which says that the country that registers the space object with the United Nations automatically has jurisdiction over the, the space object and any astronauts that are on board, uh, and even when the astronauts leave. So uh, if a, a, a rocket flies to the moon uh, and it's launched by SpaceX, it's a US company, the US, U.S. laws will apply on that spacecraft, and it will apply to any people on that spacecraft, even when they're out walking and working on the moon. Um, so that will become more complicated, however, when we start um, working uh, in larger communities. And um, we have people who were born on the moon. They weren't launched there as the a spacecraft. So the laws don't work anymore, and that um, that's, will be a challenge for a future lawyer. Next, oh, this is fun. 
Is a satellite considered a weapon in space law? Excellent question. It has been considered a weapon under U.S. export controls law for many years. And uh, there was a, an effort that, that I was part of that many were pushing for to change that perception of space objects and space activity because it is viewed by some that every rocket can become a missile and must be tra treated as munitions and carefully watched, especially the international trade of these items. Um, and, and that point of view also was applied to satellites that were purely civilian in nature um, and these uh, suborbital space planes. Um, and so there was an effort and it was successful to change how civilian space assets were, were dealt with. And you're right, it's true though, that uh, any satellite, if it has propulsion, this is the view of the Department of Defense, if it has propulsion and the ability to navigate, it can be used as a kill vehicle and ram another satellite and can therefore be a weapon. So, good question. Um, Cynthia, again, how useful are the Artemis Accords? You didn't mention them in the five multilateral treaties. Is that because they're part of the OST? No, thank you for, for raising them. It is one of the more exciting uh, developments in space law. The Artemis Accords are treaties that the, is a treaty that the United States has developed recently under its Artemis program, the program to return to the moon, that if any country wants to join in our effort and be part of the Artemis program, they have to sign this treaty. And it, it basically restates much of the existing space law and requires our partners to be good citizens uh, when they're operating in the Artemis program. Uh, but it does, uh, it contains some innovations as well. Most strikingly, this idea of safety zones, that if you uh, engage in operations on the moon of whatever kind, then you are going to publicize a safety zone around it where people should not enter it uh, because it, it might not be safe. Now that has caused some consternation uh, among other countries because it seems like it's uh, a claim of land, that it's an exclusionary zone. Do not come in within the safety zone, which it is not, and that is not its intent. Um, but it is an important development of law. Um, and it's been somewhat controversial, but also um, has uh, progressed nicely. And I think there are now 13 or 14 countries that have signed it. So it is a type of multilateral treaty, but different than the, the other ones. What research has the Global uh, Space Law Center uh, produced on property rights, specifically this problem of ownership versus extraction? Well, we have, thank you, Trey. Um, um, we have worked uh, with the Hague Working Group, which was a, a, a non-governmental organization composed of uh, industry members, academics, scientists, to try to develop uh, rules for resource extraction, moon mining, asteroid mining. And uh, uh, my students, and this is a benefit of uh, attending uh, Cleveland State University, you can join my research council and work with me directly on initiatives like this, uh, which directly shaped the uh, evolution of space law. And so we've been working on, uh, for example, priority rights for those who are mining on the moon, which is the, the next hottest thing. But also we've been working on an initiative for sharing information about lunar activities, uh, a new kind of registration practice, because the prior registration uh, requirement was really designed for orbital activity, but now we're going to the moon. We need a new way to share information. I think we have room, maybe time for one more. Faith Obafemi, um, question number two. We've seen the governance of the internet evolve from purely nonprofit effort to becoming a driver of trade in the economy. Yes. With the influx of private actors, new business models, and reduced costs, can we expect similar involvement in space government governance? Yes, absolutely, we will. And I think uh, the space infrastructure is already inextricably woven with your life and my life through GPS, telecommunications. Um, but we hope to see that uh, continue to evolve so that the the world economy may become eventually 
largely based on the internet, but also on space manufacturing, uh, the retrieval of natural resources from the moon and asteroids rather than devouring the resources of our mother earth to take all industry off planet uh, to reduce pollution. Um, that kind of dependence and integration of space into our society um, is likely to happen and we will need more and more laws to ensure that it's done in a safe and a proper way, a fair way. I will continue to, to answer questions as long as my moderator feeds them to me. Um, um, and I ask them to let me know when it's time to sign off. I'll keep an eye on our chat. Um, but here's another question from Tess. How do you think global governance will regulate uh, commerce and privatization in, in space innovation? And that's a good question, too. Unfortunately, I mentioned that, that the international treaties uh, were from the 60s and 70s, and that's because it's become much more difficult. We haven't had any recent multilateral treaties. The Moon Agreement failed in 79. It's become very hard to write binding international law because there are many more uh, governments involved. It used to be that just the U.S. and Russia, the Soviet Union had to agree on something and the treaty would be completed. But now we have over 100 co countries that are involved in the Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. It's very hard to get agreement. Um, and so we, we find softer types of laws that are recommended on the international level where most of the action is and most of the binding law is being created is on the domestic level. Uh, new uh, U.S. statutes and regulations or uh, statutes and regulations in other countries. Um, but, but international solutions will be needed because it's very much an international activity. Um, from Adam Bingham, question pertaining to the applicability and calculation of ITU cost recovery fees for a full FCC Part 25 non-small sat license applicant. If I have a satellite utilizing the KU band in LEO going through a full FCC Part 25 license, am I required to file with the ITU? If no uh, requirement, is there any benefit of doing so? In either case, how do I calculate the fees? Note on fee calculation. I've looked extensively at the ITU published documentation on fee calculation and find the information too obscure to be readily understandable. If possibly, can you please explain it? I would love to explain it. Uh, I'll go on ahead, but I will. Um, this is, I think, a more detailed uh, question that, would, uh, that I, I'm not going to offer an answer off the top of my head. Um, but I encourage you to uh, contact me, and I'd be glad to, to work with you on resolving this. This is exactly the, a good example of the complexity of space regulation and why you need uh, lawyers. So thank you for your question, um, but please reach out to me privately. I'm easy enough to contact uh, m.sundahl at csuohio.edu. The Google search will find me quickly. Um, according to the current development of science and space technology, do you believe the UN should update space law? Yes, I do. Uh, most pressingly, we need to update the uh, law regarding militarization of outer space to prohibit kinetic anti-satellite tests. Um, but we're also going to need uh, updates regarding the how we are going to assign the use of property on the moon and other celestial bodies. Uh, as well as the regulation of private activity on orbit, space traffic management. Um, so there are a lot of fields um, that the UN needs to work on, and they are working on. A working group was just established last year at the UN to deal with uh, resource extraction issues, such as priority rights. Now from Fairman. According to the current development of science and space technology, oh, uh, we just answered that one, I'm sorry. Um, 
I thought a new one had popped on the screen. Thank you, Fairman, for that. Uh, Atul Kumar, uh, due to different stakeholders and unclear boundaries, is it ever possible to codify the space law? If yes, then how to determine the jurisdiction? Yes, yeah, so I've talked some about jurisdiction already. I think it's fairly clear from the Outer Space Treaty that uh, registration dictates jurisdiction, but we also have international law regarding uh, the prescriptive jurisdiction, the right of states to regulate activity. For example, does the United States have the right to regulate a Chinese sailor who's fishing in Chinese waters? Under international law, no. But does China have the right to regulate a US national who is fishing in Chinese waters? Under international law, yes. And those, um, those rules about the ability to regulate activity outside of your borders apply to outer space as well. International law, and this is in the Outer Space Treaty, existing international law applies to outer space. Um, now, there are questions about that. For example, do, uh, does, international, uh, does international environmental law apply to orbital debris? That has not been done in any serious way, but there are calls for the extension of of environmental law to apply to space activities. Okay. Um, Faith Obafemi, thank you for your question. Do you take PhD students in space law? Uh, uh, Cleveland State does not have a doctoral program. Uh, there is a doctoral program at the University of Nebraska uh, and then in other parts of the world, such as Canada, McGill, Cologne, the great University of Cologne, Germany, uh, the University of Luxembourg, and uh, the University of Leiden in, the, in Holland. So those are some of the great space law centers. Um, and there are a number of universities in China and India as well, but I'm not sure if they're doctoral programs. But at, at this point, uh, Cleveland State University um, offers a uh, program for law students and will soon be offering degrees, uh, ma master's degrees in space law. Okay. Well, I think we've come to the end of the presentation. Um, I Before we... Before we uh, part ways, I want to, first of all, uh, thank you all for an exhilarating uh, hour. I hope that you found it as much fun as I did. Um, the fascinating field of space law is really taking off now, so to speak, and we do truly need lawyers. Um, the companies, all the companies need uh, guidance to uh, navigate all the regulations and laws for licensing and other issues. Um, and the government agencies as well, as they get more applications for licenses of various types, they need to staff up in order to handle them. In fact, it's one of the complaints of SpaceX is that they are building rockets and launching them faster than they can get their licenses granted. Uh, and that's because the FAA is understaffed. Uh, so they will be expanding, and that means job openings for young lawyers. So I hope you all um, think about that and consider the possibility of a career in space law. Before we leave now, I'm going to announce uh, the winner of our question competition, and the award goes to uh, Cynthia, who... Uh, uh, asked, I thought, uh, very probing. There were many questions that were very good. Really, all of them were, but the award will go to Cynthia, and I will ask our moderators at Lorena to um, reach out. And um, yes, here's her name, Cynthia Levinson, exactly right, who um, brought to um, our attention the Artemis Accords and its relevance to international law and um, the Outer Space Treaty. So thank you for uh, asking that question. Excellent question. And I look forward to the opportunity to meet with you uh, privately.
So thank you very much. I'm going to sign off, but I wish you all a beautiful day and uh, onwards and upwards, as us space lawyers say. Remember, as uh, I tell my students, the sky is no longer the limit. Thank you very much. <laughs>